Scholastica for the warm welcome, and thank you to the, the Michael Ramsey Center and uh, St. St. Anthony's Priory. As, as someone who's in, in, very involved in the life of, of Pusey House and have been blessed by having a Catholic Anglican presence in Oxford, I'm excited uh, to see what, what God does at this place uh, in, in the future, and excited to see another Catholic Anglican institution that can be a home for scholars and students and ordinands. Uh, I recognize that although John Neville Figgis in my small circle is uh, a major theological figure and uh, political thinker and so on, that he, he is not that for everyone. I mean, during his day, his, his uh, books of sermons and his books of political theory were, were bestsellers. He was uh, in high demand as a lecturer and speaker, and he was considered one of the greatest apologists of his day. So in the same way we think of uh, C.S. Lewis or N.T. Wright, people would have thought of John Neville Figgis. But, but I, I recognize most of his books are out of print. That's why I'm involved in putting some of them back into print. And this morning, uh, e even our uh, host, Father Nicholas, mentioned to me that this was going to be a, a somewhat... A, obscure figure that we were covering today. So, so uh, he, he, was, he was aware that not everyone would have necessarily heard of him. So before I delve into the actual topic at hand, looking at freedom in personhood and the Christian personalism of John Neville Figgis, I thought I'd just say a few things about him so you kind of can place him on a map. Uh, Figgis was born in 1866. His father was a Calvinist minister in a revivalist tradition called the Countess of Huntingdon's Connection. Uh, he, he went uh, up to Cambridge and st read history with two major historians who had a significant influence on him. One was Maitland, who brought the, a German uh, historical tradition and political theory to, to the English consciousness, a, a tradition that had been explored by the, the great legal theorist Gierke. And uh, he, he was a religious skeptic, and that had a significant influence on a young Figgis. And he found himself reading much of the German higher criticism of his day, and that started to bring him to have a more um, disenchanted view of the Christian faith, or a more skeptical view of the supernatural claims of Christianity. Uh, he was also influenced by Lord Acton, and studied with Lord Acton, and Throughout his life, he, he maintained that relationship. Um, one of his final works that was published was actually Lord, Lord Action, Acton's major work on liberty, and that was edited by Figgis. So, so these two figures, Maitland, whose major theory had to do with the nature of society and corporate persons in relation to individuals in the state, and Lord Acton, who was um, focused on freedom and liberalism and how that should relate to Catholicity. These themes come up throughout Figgis' work, and there are some great questions raised by these two influences and the different directions that they take him in. And so that's something I want us to keep in mind as we're, as we're um, taking a sort of walk through Figgis's theory of individual persons and corporate persons in the state, what these two might have contributed to his thought, and where he actually does constructive work and perhaps departs from his mentors. Uh, he, he was also influenced by a, a bishop, Manuel Creighton, and that bishop uh, ordained him as a priest. When he was ordained, he was still of this more, what we might call sort of middle-of-the-road uh, churchmanship or even a, a liberal Catholic churchmanship. And that was untenable for Figgis. As a parish priest, he, he says that educating parishioners, um, educating children, teaching catechesis, his, his uh, de-supernaturalized form of Christianity proved impossible. And, and so he actually ended up converting to a, a more um, Newman-esque, uh, what, what he would describe as a Catholic orthodoxy. And, and he is significantly influenced by John Henry Newman in both his philosophy and theology and in this transition that occurred 
uh, early in his time as a priest. He then went on to join the community of the resurrection uh, and, and embrace a life of, of poverty. And he did see this as a sacrifice because he was a renowned historian at Cambridge and, and a celebrated young scholar. And, and he, he also served as the warden of the Oratory of the Good Shepherd. So it, it's good to keep all these things in mind as we're discussing what he has to say about freedom in personhood and uh, Christian personalism. So, I hope all of you have a handout so you can follow along, because Figgis is a very lively writer, and uh, he, he, uh, his, his political theory and his theology jump off the page, and I think that will be made clear in this first passage that we're going to look at, where he discusses the religious and philosophical scene in the early 20th century, when he was coming of age as an author and as an apologist. Um, my wife thought this was a somewhat uh, wild initial quote to, to select um, because it, it sort of sh shows the pugnacious side of John Neville Figgis. If you read Mark Chapman's uh, contribution to the recent book that came out on Figgis, uh, it, it still rubs some people the wrong way, you can tell. But uh, he, he, he says in this quote that Christians now find ourselves once again in the sort of situation we were in in the early centuries of the church in which Christianity is one creed among many. And there's a sort of hurly-burly, a, a, a noisy back and forth, a wild kind of tumult of different religions in contestation. Elsewhere, he'll talk about how uh, in, the, in the 19th century, there was a sort of liberal consensus in which Christian ethics was still celebrated, even if the supernatural claims of Christianity were discounted. Uh, he says now, instead, we have, we have new thoughts, we have theosophy, we have religions from the East, we have uh, various ideologies, pantheism, he, he's particularly concerned about pantheism, you're going to see throughout this talk, uh, all of these different, different uh, philosophies on the rise and in competition with Christianity. And he says, as Christianity enters into this contest in the early 20th century, the most that we can really hope for from the state or from society as a whole is freedom to proclaim the truth. Uh, th this is a, an interesting claim that will tell us a lot about his political theory, uh, w which is where he is most influential. So if you see John Neville Figgis talked about in our day and age, it is most often because he wrote a book called Churches in the Modern State. Churches in the Modern State is a key, key work on what is sometimes referred to as classical pluralism. It was a definitive work that, that uh, influenced people such as Harold Lasky and others. And so as we're going through this talk, I do want to discuss uh, his, his political theory and his thoughts on corporate personhood and how they should relate to the state. But I do not exclusively want to talk about that because I think the, the more interesting question is how his theology and how his theological anthropology relate to this theory of classical personalism. And so that's what I want to try to understand. So if you look at your outline, you're going to see kind of a roadmap for how we're going to explore these questions. So we're going to start out by looking at Figgis himself. What exactly is his theological anthropology? What does he say about what it means to be humans made in the image of God? Uh, what is unique about being human persons? And, and then we're going to look at how this individual personhood relates to corporate personhood. So what is his theory of classical pluralism? What, what is the importance of corporate persons in uh, a society such, such as uh, the one we have here in England or in America or other societies that particularly uh, have a robust tradition of practicing the arts of association? Then we're, we're going to turn from looking at uh, what Figgis himself had to say about these things, to what two interpreters of Figgis or the theory of classical pluralism have to say vis-a-vis -vis the relationship between theology and classical pluralism. So the two figures both, uh, I think, take Figgis' 
thoughts and, and this tradition seriously, uh, they, they both engage with it in ways that I, I think are, are um, honest interpretations of what Figgis had to say, but they go in significantly different directions. So we're going to look at what Rowan Williams has to say about theology and classical pluralism, and then also what Joseph Ratzinger has to say. And then finally, uh, I think that we find a sort of resolution or a standpoint from Figgis that is distinct or at least offers a unique contribution relative to what they both have to say. And, and that specifically relates to his perspective on the religious life. And sort of leading into that, we're going to look at, at what um, E.L. Maskell has to say about Christian personalism, how it sort of sets, sets the scene. And, and, and yes, I, I realize that Maskell lived uh, long after John Neville Figgis, but, but as we look at the passage, I think it'll come into focus why that is helpful to think about. Um, so, one thing that you might notice from the, the title of this talk, Freedom in Personhood, it, it, is that I'm immediately raising a question. Um, John Neville Figgis is remembered as someone who's critical of capitalism and individualism and the modern atomism, and, and so one might assume that he'd be critical of freedom, uh, as we might find Catholic integralists today criticizing sort of cult of individual autonomy and its dehumanizing effects on our society. And yet we see, as I mentioned, uh, freedom being a central theme in Figgis' thought. You can't understand his theology or his political theory without understanding what he has to say about freedom. And, and so this freedom, though, is not seen as in competition with personhood or corporate personhood or social life, but somehow as essential to it. And, and so we have to look at, at what Figgis has to say um, in, in his... Uh, apologetic work in his sermons and also in his political theory in order to understand how this can be the case. There's one other figure I've come across who's specifically focused on Figgis, Figgis as a Christian per personalist, and he's a theologian named Andrew Grosso. He contributed a chapter to the recent book, Neville Figgis, His Life, Thought, and Significance, in which he looks at what Figgis has to say on personhood and freedom over and against what Nietzsche has to say. So one of the final books that Figgis wrote was the Gospel of Christ and the Gospel of, of Nietzsche, and it was called The Will to Freedom over and against The Will to Power. So Grosso focuses particular, particularly on how Figgis' reading of Nietzsche, although critical in many ways, does agree with him that Christians are not mechanists or determinists or, or people who simply think that we, because we are matter or physical and part of a chain of physical causation, that means that we do not actually have the, the freedom of choice or uh, judgment or action or, or um, will. But instead, what, what Grosso points out is that Figgis sees something valuable in Nietzsche's emphasis on freedom over and against uh, some of the things that he Hegel, um, Schopenhauer, and, and Hobbes had to say about, about um, causation and will and human nature. And, and so he sees that there's actually a, a similarity there. However, as you'll note in this passage from Grosso, the, the, pers the Christian personalism comes in where Figgis makes the claim that, like God, we are, we are spirit. We are not simply physical. And, and, and so there's, there's a relationship between God as spirit and human persons as spirit in our freedom or our, our ability to operate outside of the chain of physical causation. I then turn to the actual passage that Grosso is, is gesturing at, from this apologetic work um, on, on uh, the gospel and human needs, the Halcyon lectures that Figgis gave at the University of Cambridge. In this passage, we actually see 
Figgis adopt the term personalism and, and make the points that human persons are spirits. And why, why is this so important, we might ask, that, that we are spirits? So Figgis, as an, a young priest and a young theological writer, he would have been skeptical of claims such as the virgin birth, the resurrection, uh, the even you know, basic doctrines of the creed and the supernatural claims of Christianity. He would have been skeptical of the claims of miracles in the New Testament. And he actually turns this on, his, on its head in his apologetic work, uh, works going forward. He says the fact that miracles exist show us that God is spirit. God is not simply part of uh, nature and the physical world. He is not a pantheistic God. He is not simply um, inevitably going to act in certain ways. And so you find some theologians today who would say that God had to, had to create because it's part of his nature, or God had to become incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ because it's part of what he is as three in one, or so, so on and so forth. Uh, you also see people say that God had to uh, give himself up as a sacrifice on the cross. Uh, th th this is all part of, of his nature, and therefore this is how he must act. And Figgis wants to emphasize the freedom of God, uh, not that, that goodness is not um, in, in God's nature, and he, does not, he, he, would, he would agree that God does not act in an arbitrary way, but there's freedom within the good would be Figgis' claim. And he would say that in miracles, God is showing us that he is able to act outside of this, outside of this system. And part of what it is to be persons made in the image of God, Figgis would want to emphasize, is to be able to also make free choices. He, he speaks uh, in various places about why we will never be able to perfectly predict human behavior. This is, this is why the social sciences do not operate in the same way as the physical sciences. He thinks that there was a sort of hubris to a lot of um, scientific thinkers of his day who, who would have claimed that these sort of things were only a matter of time and study, and eventually uh, scientists would be able to, to predict human action. But his point is that one of, one of the ways that we reflect God as spirit is that we can make these choices. We have this ability to use our, our will. Um, so individual personhood for Figgis is important. Uh, he doesn't write about it nearly as much, though, as he writes about corporate personhood and what it means for us to relate to um, what, what he often will, will actually call um, group persons or real group persons. And so we can now look at the case that, that Figgis makes for classical pluralism. And I hope, I hope that my use of this term doesn't just distract from the point that Figgis is trying to make. It's sort of contested what we want to call Figgis' political theory. In, in the introduction to the book that I mentioned earlier, Rowan Williams refers to it as association associationalism. Uh, the, the legal theorist who I'm referencing by calling it classical pluralism is a friend of mine, fellow researcher at, at Pusey House, who I cite in this paper, uh, Patrick Nash. He actually, as an atheist and a uh, legal scholar, introduced me to Figgis' work, and he thought it was scandalous that I, as an Anglo-Catholic, didn't know these sermons, which were the best thing he'd ever read, and, and uh, he told me if, there, if they were really preaching like this today, he would become a Christian. Uh, but but um, so, so he, he refers to it cla as classical pluralism, and I think he has good reason to do so, and this, this should become clear as we talk about exactly what Figgis' theory is. So... The idea in classical pluralism is that at, at base, society is not comprised of a state, a sovereign state, with all power and all authority over individuals. Um, this is not true to human nature, it's not true to history, it's not true to reality. 
And instead, what exists throughout human history and throughout uh, human societies are various, ver various group persons. And so you see this in a family. You have children born dependent upon parents and parents caring for these children and having authority over these children. And you see it in unions. The union could not exist if the union leaders did not have a certain amount of authority. And you also see it in the church. And Figgis' most famous work on his theory of classical pluralism is called Churches in the Modern State. You might think he's referring to Protestantism and the many denominations that one might have within the modern state. No, he's referring to free associations, self-governing associations, corporate persons, as churches. He doesn't say this specifically, but, but my interpretation of this, he's, he's looking at the church as an archetypical uh, group person, and all other group persons is somehow pointing toward that uh, as types of the church. Um, so he wants to define classical pluralism over and against theories of sovereignty that, that you have found throughout human history. He argues that there's this tendency throughout human history to make a sort of fiction that claims that you only have a, a particular sovereign with all power and all authority uh, relating to individuals. And, and he traces that across political history. But before he started writing works of apologetic and theology and, and focusing on Christianity in his writing, he, he wrote um, a couple award-winning books on political thought, uh, the first of which was The Theory of the Divine Right of Kings, but he then also wrote one that um, looked at sort of history of, of political thought and dealt with this question of sovereignty. And so he, he's arguing that this is not, this is not true to, to reality, but instead um, that there are sort of equivocal moves that people who want to defend this theory of sovereignty have to pull in order to try to justify it. So they'll say, well, even if not explicitly holding this uh, power or authority over individuals, implicitly that's always the case, or, or th they'll, they'll try to claim that only by permission do these other social groups exist. Uh, and, and Figgis wants to emphasize, no, not by permission. These, these um, group persons pre-exist the, the state, and they exist beyond its power. So even a totalitarian system that wanted to control all group persons, the associative instinct in us is so strong that this could never happen. It's not possible. He, he says, perhaps in a very small sort of city-state, you might get something that appears to be working in this way. But that even then, this doesn't really speak to the nature of group activity or society. So this, this leads us to uh, an, an interesting question. If society is primarily comp comprised of these group persons that are often pursuing a common good, but they often differ in terms of their philosophy or in terms of their understanding of the good. How can a society function or how can a state function? How, how can this give us a, a definition of the best regime, for instance? And, and, and so you have this problem of the freedom for the church among other churches. It, in our, in our society, we can look at um, the Christian church as having certain distinct beliefs and practices over and against secular society. And so how can it continue to exist when there are other groups that would see certain Christian beliefs as unjust or op oppressive or unfair or out of step with current uh, social norms? And so he's trying to explore what, what Christians should do as they're living through these great societal transformations in the 20th century, and as they're trying to find their footing. It is Figgis' claim, at least in some places, uh, such as the ones I'm quoting here, that the church should not seek 
to make all of her members vote in a particular way or take particular political stances to, uh, to, to legislate Christian morality for all of society. You'll see here he, he says that the majority of people are not churchmen and they're not going to become churchmen. And so the idea that Christian law should be the law for all of these people who have different philosophies or simply chase every new fad, he doesn't think makes sense. And as we saw in that initial quote about the hurly-burly society, he, he, he would claim liberty does not mean that, that you have the right to punch your neighbor or, or you know, to coerce them to act the way that you would want them to act. And, and so this is a... This is a tension in Figgis' thought. On one hand, after his Anglo-Catholic conversion, he has a passionate adherence to Christian dogma and Christian truth. And he goes around preaching that Christians need to be countercultural and they need to teach the distinctives of their faith, whether that has to do with the beliefs or the practices. And they need to bold, be bold about the fact that if you're going to have a living civilization and a vibrant culture, you need to be salt and light, and that means uh, putting forward a different way of life. So, so he, he will boldly proclaim these things, but then on the other hand, we see here, he seems to say, well, if Christians are, are influenced by the church in terms of how they vote, or in terms of what they think public morality should be, that, that this is somehow unjust, or somehow violates the, the, the idea of the best regime that he has um, in this theory of classical pluralism. So there are sort of two, two, two kind of um, paths one can take at interpreting Figgis on classical pluralism. One can emphasize his, his uh, confidence in Christian truth and his desire to see it leaven a civilization, or one can emphasize his vision of different group persons following their own idea of the good life and living in relative harmony. You can see Patrick Nash tries to square this circle by saying that, that Figgis is claiming that we simply need a good balance, you know, rights for the individual, rights for associations, and a social consensus, or uh, rights for the state to keep the peace between individuals and groups, and groups and other groups, and so on. And so he, he gives a kind of harmonizing of these divergent tendencies in Figgis. I think that Rowan Williams... And Joseph Ratzinger, in contrast, focus on one or the other side of his thoughts. So let's first turn to Rowan Williams. Uh, many of you may be familiar with some of the passages that I'm citing here. He was involved in a certain amount of controversy, not in each of these essays or, or talks or books that I cite, but in particular with what he had to say about Islam and public life. Uh, but, but Williams wrote the introduction to the recent book on Figgis. He cites him in, in these articles and books. And he, he is certainly trying to apply cer certain aspects of churches in the modern state as he's dealing with this question of what do we do as now only 8% of Brits go to church? Uh, and and um, the established church is no longer shaping the beliefs and practices of, of most um, people in Britain. You know, how do we deal with that in a humane and just way? So William's approach to this is to say that Figgis has given us excellent resources to liberate the real group persons throughout society, including Jewish groups, Muslim groups, uh, Catholic groups, as distinct from Anglicans, as the Church of England has um, reformed certain teachings on, on marriage, say, or, or even um, uh, other such groups, and, and we should let them perhaps even have their own laws that, that people can opt into or opt out of. So you can imagine a situation in which you had several different marriage contracts, I don't think, okay, we might not want to use the word contracts depending on the sort of language used in each tradition, but di different uh, marital commitments one could legally enter into depending if you wanted to associate with a particular uh, Muslim group or a particular Jewish group or a particular 
Protestant group or a Catholic group, and then the, the state would allow you to have arbitration within your group rather than having sort of one norm for all British citizens. He, Williams points toward Native American groups in Canada who have been allowed to do this sort of thing and, and Jewish groups elsewhere, and also points toward the strong norms in the Middle East for allowing different Islamic groups to have their own private courts or private laws. As you can imagine, this was a controversial proposal in the West. And so you, you see in various places, Williams try to nuance it and say, even if this were allowed, this would, of course, be done in a careful and cautious way. Uh, it would be done with a careful attention to human rights and dignity and so on and so forth. But clearly his interpretation of classical pluralism and its relationship to, to Christian theology is informed by his understanding of the Christian rule of faith, or, or what he calls test of an orthodoxy, and, and also his understanding of Christian truth. So you'll see at the opening of this Williams section, I cite from a, a book that he wrote, uh, contributed to in honor of the Oxford movement. And he wrote an essay there on Catholic orthodoxy. And I think it's helpful if you want to understand what's going on with William's approach to classical pluralism to see what he's, he wants to see elevated as the, the test of an orthodoxy. Or we can apply it in particular to the Church of England or to um, Catholic Orthodox, Catholic Christianity as what should be the test of Catholic Christianity in this day and age. And Whereas traditionally, when you talk about the test of an orthodoxy or the rule of faith, you, you might think of St. Vincent of Laurens talking about what is believed everywhere, always, and by all. Or you might think of Anglo-Catholics who talk about the two testaments, seven councils, seven sacraments, uh, and, and the um, teaching of the, the prayer book and the articles. You do not see Williams take a similar approach here. What he wants to say is, is, is it um, coherent? Is it inclusive? Does it promote a good way of life? Uh, is it in, in harmony with the themes of the New Testament? And he elaborates another passage that I cite here on what he means by, is it in line with the New Testament? He does not believe that the New Testament gives us a system or a specific set of beliefs as to how we should live our lives but instead the, the New Testament gives us certain resources or certain paradigms or certain themes that we can then adopt in our own age in a progressive manner that allows us to see what is life-giving in the present age from these Christian resources. So he's not saying you need to simply submit to the teaching of Holy Scripture and the councils as the best way to understand what Christian morality should be. Uh, but instead, you know, what is life-giving in our day and age, and what is inclusive and not simply colonial vis-a-vis uh, -vis Christians' relationship to other religions and so on. So this is why I, I raised the question of inclusion at the start of this outline. Williams wants to understand how we can have an inclusive Christianity and how classical pluralism can help us do so. Now, we can turn to Joseph Ratzinger and his approach to classical pluralism. Ratzinger, as far as I can tell, doesn't directly cite from or engage Figgis, but he, he um, draws on Harold Blasky's work, and he references other English pluralists, which would lead me to believe he's familiar with Figgis' thought. Figgis was... Uh, important influence on Lasky, and you wouldn't have Lasky's pluralist theory without Figgis' churches in the modern state. And so as we're dealing with what Ratzinger has to say here about classical pluralism, you're going to see a lot of things that chime with what we've read earlier by Figgis about classical pluralism. So Ratzinger is going to um, say that Classical pluralism is actually compatible with Christianity, and there is a lot that we can learn from it. But he's going to say also that the church, the, the church Catholic, is not merely one association among other associations. 
it is not equatable or interchangeable with other churches. And in, in fact, it does not simply have authority over the religious part of our lives. So he says what's misleading about affirming classical pluralism is that it might sound like we're saying each person is involved with plur plurality of institutions in their life, or a plurality of group persons that have authority over different parts of their life. So Figgis talked about how the um, college is, is particularly formative for Englishmen. So, so for me, Fitzwilliam College at Cambridge, or, or uh, perhaps you would say a chaplaincy, so my, my experience at Pusey House would, would be formative. And so some people looking at that might say, ah yes, but also your family is formative in a different sphere. Or uh, growing up in Michigan, the, the laws there might shape you in a certain way in, in another sphere. Uh, Ratzinger wants to emphasize that Christianity and the church do not simply speak to a sort of religious side of life or a side of life that has to do with private devotion or going to church, but that it shapes the, the conscience and shapes all, how, how we act in all of life. So it transforms us. We talk about putting on Christ or being made a new man. It's going to alter every aspect of our lives. And so while he's affirming uh, classical pluralism, and saying that this is good, that the church would, would um, toler tolerate other group persons and not simply claim a monopoly on religious belief uh, in, in any given jurisdiction. He wants to emphasize that the Christian church is a, an authority in our lives. And as we interpret the Bible, uh, we're going to look at the Ten Commandments in light of the teaching of the New Testament and find that there are certain immutable ethical and, and, and doctrinal truths present. And we are going to need to conform ourselves to those if we want to be Catholic Christians and if we want to be committed to Catholic orthodoxy. And so he wants to emphasize that the truth is a bond. And so you're going to have Christians practice this out in all sorts of different uh, regimes, in all sorts of different political parties, in all sorts of different contexts. The, the church should never be confused for a single political party or a single regime. However, since the truth is a bond, if we, if we truly want to be free, we need to maintain our connection to reality. And the scriptures, as interpreted through the authority of the church, can tell us what is reality and can make, help us maintain that bond of truth, which makes us free. And so he wants to argue that the, the church is not going to be handing out descriptions of how you ought to vote necessarily, but it's going to be forming people's consciences when it comes to certain questions in such a clear way that it's naturally going to affect their political action and their polities, especially when they're in the majority. And so you see that in Ratzinger's quotation here that talks about the choices given to us by Christianity and by the gospel. And so he says it is always given us certain choices when it comes to human dignity, when it comes to life, when it comes to uh, the sanctity of marriage, and so on and so forth. And, and so he wants to emphasize, yes, classical pluralism is something that the church Catholic should affirm. It's something that Christians should affirm. And the, the fact that we're given a freedom of choice is a good thing. This is part of the human condition that we should affirm. However, uh, this does not mean that we should allow pluralism to enter into our religious perspective such that our inclusivism causes us to adopt relativism when it comes to the truth. But he says that, that through the, the faith once delivered as interpreted by the church, you can still arrive at authoritative teaching that should be shaping your conscience recognize that we are at 45 minutes, and so we're going to turn to our final section, which um, seemed to have, have misnumbered as section four, but is in fact section three. Uh, and this is where we're going to look at Christian personalism and classical pluralism. How do they fit together? Uh, that, that's, that's an important question in the midst of all of this. How do they relate? Can they fit together? Can we truly believe that it's Christianity that reveals what it means to be human, that tells us what human nature is, 
and also affirm classical pluralism or, or this emphasis on tolerance and choice in modern society. I don't think that Figgis ends up giving us a definitive answer whether, whether we should move in the direction of Rowan Williams or Joseph Ratzinger on these questions. I, I, I think um, when it comes to his apologetic, it certainly di differs from that taken by Williams. And uh, when it comes to his desire to see people of different religions and philosophies convert, but when it comes to the free play of corporate persons, his theory does seem to allow for the kind of speculation and the kind of imaginative possibilities that Williams is laying out. Uh, I, I don't know that his, um, his understanding of, of these things would necessarily lead him to, to have quite such clear statements about the extent to which Christianity and the teaching of the church should affect one's moral and political action in public life as Ratzinger. However, what we can see here is that the relationship between the freedom of individual persons and the freedom of group persons shaped Figgis' way of life and his most important decisions in his life. And I think we find a clue to why this is the case in this passage that I've pulled up here by Eric Maskell. Eric Maskell was influenced by Figgis' theology and his social thought. He was a member of the Oratory of the Good Shepherd and was very involved in the Christian sociology movement that many Anglo-Catholics were involved in during his day. And in this book on Christian anthropology, The Importance of Being Human, he, he points out two important characteristics about what it is to be a human person made in the image of God. And I think they give us a clue to how Figgis lived his life and how he theorized. So he says, as, as persons made in the image of God, there is a certain extent to which we participate in God's creative life, in our inner selves. And so this is hard for us to fathom in this current age. I was just speaking with uh, Father Nicholas this morning about the, the decline of monasticism and the decline of religious life in the West. And he was talking about how it's not just monasticism. It's all, all institutions that require commitment or, or um, self-sacrifice or the loss of, of individual autonomy in order to participate in them. Are, these are seeing declines. And in, in a Christian society, there's a certain support given to commitment and corporate persons and, and social bonds. If we believe what Maskell is saying here about characteristics of what it is to be human. So he says that you know, as God becoming Christ um, in, in the flesh made this free choice to sacrifice himself for us, and as God, through his free choice and, and his will, created the earth, we see God acting in, as, as a sort of self-gift. Uh, and we as persons, he says, are also given the ability to, through, through our will and through our intellect and, and our actions, to make a gift of ourselves and to have a responsible will. And so he points toward three particular examples where you can make an irrevoc irrevocable gift of the self. And, and this is something that sounds cruel to us nowadays, or at least to many of us, because that word irrevocable, the idea that once you've made the decision, it might involve pain or suffering afterward if you cannot get out of it. Uh, in particular, he says, when we give ourselves in marriage, this is an, an indissoluble bond that reflects in Christ's marriage to the church. And therefore, this is a, a way in which we're participating in God's creativity. Or, or um, and, and he says another way that this can be done is through a religious vow that you could make an, an irrevocable commitment. And and um, and and so so um, I, I seem to be. Um, is there a third a third uh, way there that he cites? Does anyone have this? What? Oh yes, and of course the the, the um, Ultimate question, union with God or separation from God, to give yourself into, into union with God, to, 
enter the waters of baptism to put your faith in, in uh, Christ and so on, or to, to um, choose to turn in upon yourself. This is the language that Maskell would use to describe these things. Uh, th- th- this also represents this, this freedom. And this freedom is, is occurring within relationship, right? That, that when we think about these ultimate acts of freedom, as Maskell is discussing them, they are acts of love, marriage, or commitment to a religious order, or a commitment to God. These are reciprocal um, actions that, that happen between persons. So it is not as if figus or masculine are simply celebrating the arbitrary act of the, of the free will, but instead they're understanding freedom as existing ultimately in personhood, um, in, in um, persons, uh, individual persons as made in the image of God, and also uh, as um, members of the, the corporate person of the church. And so we then turn to two passages um, that from, from uh, Figgis himself, in which he's describing his decision to join the community of the resurrection. He's a successful academic in Cambridge. He has a cushy life. He's actually well known for enjoying uh, the, the Cambridge dinners and Cambridge parties and the Cambridge social scene. Uh, people would not have taken him as the sort of guy who would choose to be a monk. But he says, in this day and age, no one's going to take Christianity seriously if we're not actually willing to live it out. So sell everything that you have and follow me. And, and so during his time as a parish priest, he says that he goes through a period of discernment, which he's trying to decide whether or not he should join the community of the resurrection. And his father is, is threatening him in terms of the relationship if he makes this decision. He, he uh, Clearly, the flesh doesn't want to make this decision. But he says that he comes to the conclusion that God has called him to make this decision, and this is the sort of thing that needs to happen if Christianity is going to reach people in this day and age. And, and so he would be a coward if he didn't do it. So he takes the courageous step of, of making this commitment. And so as we reflect on freedom in personhood and the Christian personalism of Figgis, I thought it could be interesting to discuss how his theology and, and Maskell's theology uh, can inform uh, uh, perhaps a, um, a, a renaissance of the religious life, or, or if, if the, we held this kind of theology today, would it, would it contribute to that? Or is there something else going on here? Is it not a theological issue, but it's more sociological or technological or something else? Uh, I just thought it was fascinating to look into... Uh, the extent to which Figgis' own conviction seems to be caught up in his theological anthropology, his own conviction about the need to join this uh, monastic community. So thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions.